Today on the Audio Hotline, we got a pretty exciting one. I'm going to be reviewing the brand new, as of June 2022, audio interface that Focusrite just put out. In fact, it's kind of like a whole product line that they just put out. But the one I'm going to be reviewing today is the Focusrite Vocaster 1. First thing I want to do is just send a big thank you to Focusrite for sending this over, but also disclose that Focusrite did send this over. I'm not obligated to say anything specific about it, to review it in a certain way, to say it's good. Nothing like that, they just sent it over for an honest review. And just a fair warning, some of my videos can get a little bit lengthy if you wanna see certain things or jump around to different stuff, there will be timestamps down below. Before I go into anything about the Vocaster 1 specifically, there are two things I want to let you know. First, this is the Shure SM7B, the microphone that everyone uses to review audio interfaces because it requires so much damn gain! This is going into the Vocaster 1 using a warm audio XLR cable. The Vocaster 1 is going into my MacBook M1 Pro. And I actually am using Hindenburg Lite to record this. And the Vocaster 1 does actually come with a free license for that. Now for the second thing, the little bit more exciting part. Alongside the Vocaster 1 also came out the Vocaster 2. And essentially that is an audio interface also that comes with two XLR inputs rather than just the one that comes on the Vocaster 1, you know, makes sense. But also the Vocaster 2 does come with Bluetooth compatibility. So you can actually get Bluetooth audio into your Vocaster 2. Other than that, they are pretty similar. But in addition to the two audio interfaces that they came out with, they also came out with two bundles that are associated with each of the names. The Vocaster 1 Studio and the Vocaster 2 Studio. Both of these bundles will come with an XLR cable as well as Focusrite's headphones, the HP 60Vs. But both of these also do come with microphones, but not the same microphone. The Vocaster 1 Studio comes with the new Focusrite DM1 microphone that looks more like your handheld dynamic mic. And the Vocaster 2 Studio comes with actually more of a broadcast style dynamic microphone. And the name of that microphone is the DM14V. Both of these studio kits do look pretty sweet, I will say. But when it comes to the pricing of the Vocaster 1 audio interface, it is going to be coming in at $200 USD. The Vocaster 1 Studio is going to be coming in at $300. The Vocaster 2 audio interface, just for the interface, is also going to be coming in at $300 USD. And the Vocaster 2 Studio is actually going to be coming in at a whopping $500. Now, I'm not willing to comment on like the quality of those microphones or anything. I haven't touched them myself, but it might be something that I review in the the future. But now let's go ahead and move on to some more specifics about the Vocaster 1. First looking at this audio interface, it obviously looks very different compared to the Scarlet line or the Claret line. The Vocaster 1 has its dials up on the top and then it has, you know, its inputs and outputs on the side. Whereas everything on the Scarlet line has always been on its sides and it's just been like a little box. They're super nice though, they're built really well. I will say the Vocaster isn't built as sturdy as these metal boxes but it does still have a very good quality. So I was excited to see that Focusrite kind of stepped out of what they usually do and did something a little different. It's very obvious just from the build, the inputs and outputs, the labeling of those inputs and outputs, that this is meant for, you know, podcasting or content creation versus, you know, like musicians when it comes to the Scarlet and Claret. On the Scarlet, you have combo jacks with the XLR and 1 4th inch inputs. And actually on the Vocaster 1, there isn't a 1 4th inch input or line input for an instrument. So it's definitely a little different. Some people might be disappointed, but I'm sure that like me, a lot of other people are going to be very excited. But there are some really cool features when it comes to the Vocaster line that I'm really excited to tell you about today. So let's go ahead and get into some of that stuff. Let's first go over some of the accessories. When you purchase the Vocaster 1, physically, it's pretty simple. It just comes with the audio interface as well as a USB-C to USB-A cable. That cable is about three feet in length. But the Vocaster does also come with some other things, including some software. The Vocaster actually comes with its own software labeled the Vocaster Hub. Inside the Vocaster Hub, you'll be able to control a lot of the levels and the features that come on the Vocaster 1. I'll dive into that software a little bit more in depth here in a little bit. In addition to its own software, it will also come with Hindenburg Lite. 
It will also come with three months of Squadcast Pro plus video, and six months of Acast Influencer to be able to publish your content. And you'll also be able to try out Hindenburg Pro for six months for free. Now when it comes to the accessories and the things that are included with the Vocaster 1, I think that it's pretty solid. I would have liked it if the cable was a little bit longer, and I would have also liked it if they included a USB-C to USB-C cable, but it's fine. It's really awesome that they made their own software for this device. It definitely rivals some of Rode's software when it comes to like being able to change features and change levels. It is super nice to be able to do all of that and there is actually some DSP that is built into this. DSP meaning there are some post-processing features that you can actually choose from. There aren't a whole lot of options or anything like that, but I'll go over that when I show you the software. Now let's go ahead and talk about the hardware itself. The dials and the features on the Vocaster 1. While I go over the features for the Vocaster 1, I do just want to let you know that I actually am using one of the features. I'm actually using the 3.5 millimeter camera out, sending that into my phone where I'm using the iRig recorder app. On the top section of the Vocaster 1, up by the logo, you will see two indication lights. There's a 48 volts light and a little laptop light. When 48 volts of phantom power is in fact engaged, that 48V light will show up red. And when the Vocaster or one is significantly powered, that laptop light will light up white. When it comes to the two big dials on the front of the Vocaster 1, on the left side, you have your microphone gain control. And actually around that gain control knob, there are two lights. And that will actually be your level indicator when you're talking into your microphone. When you're setting your gain, the light on the left side is actually kind of your indicator of how loud you have your dial set. And when you're doing that, the light associated with that will actually be white. The big dial on the right side is the volume control for the speaker output as well as the headphone output. Under those two big dials, you will see three buttons. The button on the left is the auto gain feature. So if you click the auto gain feature and then speak into your microphone like you normally would, it will try to set the gain automatically for you. This is something I test out later in the video. And when it is doing the auto gain setup, the lights around the microphone gain knob will actually be orange. And it will sort of have a little countdown for you. The middle button out of the three will actually turn on your post-processing. And once you go into the Vocaster Hub software, you can determine which sort of post-processing you want to use and then at that point that button will turn on that preset. The button on the right side is pretty straightforward. It is your microphone mute button. On the front side of the Vocaster 1 is where you will find your headphone jack. This is a quarter inch jack or 6.35 millimeter jack, however you want to say that. On the bottom of the interface there isn't anything important, just some little grippies. On the back side of the Vocaster 1 is where all of your inputs and outputs are. So let's go ahead and start over on the far right. That is where you will see your XLR port. On the Vocaster 1, it is labeled host, but on the Vocaster 2, there is one labeled host and then the next one is labeled guest. Going to the left, you will see 48 volts button. That will turn on your phantom power if you are using a condenser microphone. Next to that, you will see a little phone indication. This is actually so you can plug in your phone and get audio straight from your phone. Next to that is a Kensington key if you want to use one of those. And then going to the right a little bit and down, that is where you will see your speaker outputs. To the left of that, you will see a little camera label. This is a 3.5 millimeter jack, so you can use a 3.5 millimeter to 3.5 millimeter cable and get audio straight into your camera. That's currently what I'm using to record. To the left of that, you will see a USB-C port. This is where you can power the interface and get it plugged into your computer. And to the left of that, it's quite obvious, it's your power button. All of the options on the Vocaster 1 are really everything that you would need. I will say it would have been nice to have like an actual physical dial for each the headphone and the outputs. But actually during this whole first part, I have been using some of the post-processing that the Vocaster Hub offers. But now let's go ahead and jump into the specs that Focusrite sent over to me. The Vocaster 1 has a microphone input frequency response of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and a gain range of 70 decibels. The speaker output and the headphone output on the Vocaster 1 also have a frequency response of 20 Hz to 20 kHz. The phone input and output connector is a 3.5 mm TRRS. This has a maximum bit depth and sample rate of 48 kHz at 24 bit. Well, now that we've gone through some of that basic information, now I'm going to go ahead and start testing the Vocaster 1 out. In this, I'll try some different microphones out, test out the noise floor and everything like that. And I will also compare the Vocaster 1 to the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, just to see how it compares in a couple different ways. Now I'm going to start out by first testing a few features on the Vocaster 1, the first one being the auto gain option. 
Right now I do have Enhance on, so I'm going to turn that off real quick. And here's with Enhance on, and this is off. I had it in the radio mode. We'll go through that in a second though. While I do this test, it will temporarily mute the microphone for a few seconds while I talk into it still. That way it can try to auto estimate where it should set the gain. Right now I'm hitting about negative 12 decibels on the meter in Hindenburg and that's where I like to stay. Negative 18 to negative 12 decibels is good. So hopefully it will like auto set in that range ish. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. So now I'm talking at the same volume I usually would and I'm about to engage the auto gain option. Test this whole thing out and there it is. I think it turned it up slightly, but still I'm in a good area. Now on my peaks, I'm still, yeah, just maybe like negative 10 decibels is all, but I feel like that actually worked really well. Now let's go ahead and test the mute button, see if there's a pop associated with that mute button. So here it is unmuted and now we're going to, we are unmuted now and uh, mute one more time and it doesn't seem like a substantial pop or anything like that. It seems fine. Now I'm kind of curious if it creates any clicking issues or anything if I switch from enhanced to unenhanced and vice versa. So I'm going to switch the DSP, the post-processing, on and off a couple times while I talk and just see if that creates some sort of issue. So right now it is not enhanced, now it is enhanced. And I'm sure you just heard a, you know, bump in the volume for sure. And uh, now it is not enhanced anymore. And actually speaking of the DSP options, enhanced, but there are actually only four options in the software. Let me just briefly take you through that. So right now we have Hindenburg up behind it. You can see that I am recording and right now it is enhanced. Right now I do have the radio mode on, which does add a little bit of presence, which can sound nice on the SM7B, but it does also add some lows for sure. But with each of these four settings, the clean, the warm, the bright, and the radio, I'm gonna show you the clean version of the SM7B and then the processed version with each of them, and then we'll just compare all all four. So right now this is the clean version and then on the Vocaster 1 I'm going to disable DSP. So now this is the unprocessed SM7B and now this is the clean version of the post-processing in the Vocaster Hub. Now this is the warm option in the Vocaster Hub and now this is just the normal flat version of the SM7B. I do not have any of the switches on in the back. Once again, this is the warm edition on, and once again off, and now back on again. This is the bright post-processing option in the Vocaster Hub, and now here is just the flat version of the SM7B, and back to the bright version. Now we have the radio version that I had been using for the first while of this video, and now no post-processing, and now the radio post-processing is back on. Now let's go ahead and just run through all of the options really briefly in the Vocaster Hub, just the software that comes with this. When you open the Vocaster Hub, you'll just see all of the options that are associated with this interface. Right in the center, you'll see a meter. Sadly, it does not have like a decibel reading on it. I think that would be really nice. But you can change your microphone's level right there. You can just click and drag. You can also enable 48 volts of phantom power either on the software or actually on the Vocaster 1. Up here, you can mute the speaker output, which is cool. If you click on the three lines, it really just takes you to the description of the actual software. Nothing important in there, really. Underneath the meter and the option to change your gain, you do have the auto gain option, the enhance option, and then if you click that down arrow, it gives you those four options that we tested out earlier. Then you have your mute option. Then under here, you have your host mix. You can mute, you can turn it down. You have the auxiliary option, which this is actually when you plug your phone in or whatever you do plug into it. So right now I actually have this Ceramonic shotgun microphone that is powered on its own going into that phone input. You can use powered microphones or microphones that do not require power, or you can, of course, you know, use your phone like you're supposed to. But as you can see on that auxiliary option, you can hear me talking into this microphone and that meter going up. Next to that, you will see the loopback one and loopback two option. Same options, you can mute or change the level. And then you have your whole mix right here, which if I were to turn that down, 
you hear that it affects my microphone. It would have also affected the microphone that I had plugged in through the phone. The easiest thing for me to do right now is to go to like uncopyrighted music. So I'll do that and I'll play it through the phone and we'll test the actual phone real quick too. So right now I have the music playing from my phone going in to the Vocaster 1 and here's how that sounds. Pretty sweet. You just have music playing during your whole live stream like this. But when it comes to the Vocaster software itself, that's pretty much it. I won't take you through Hindenburg or the other ones that come with it, but you can download those as well and try those out. Now I'm going to go ahead and test out a few different microphones with this audio interface. With the SM7B right now, I do not have any post-processing on or anything like that. I just want to show you the noise floor level that I have currently when I'm actually hitting negative 12 decibels. So this is the level that I actually speak at and here is the noise floor level associated with that. Now I'm going to pretend that I don't talk as loud as I do. Right now I'm completely maxed out and I'm nearly whispering on the SM7B. And here's the noise floor level associated with completely maxing out this microphone on this interface. I feel like this microphone could be paired quite often with the Vocaster 1 in the future. I feel like a lot of people that were willing to spend the $100 on the pod mic didn't necessarily go and spend $600 on the Rodecaster Pro. So the $200 associated with the Vocaster 1 seems a little bit more appropriate. But here's how it sounds with the Rode pod mic, and I'm actually just barely over 50% on the gain level. Now we have the $20 Behringer XM8500 plugged into the Vocaster 1, and I have the gain set exactly at 50%. It definitely feels like the Vocaster 1 has plenty of gain to offer to dynamic microphones, even gain-hungry ones. I just had to. This is the SEV7. Once again, gains at 50%. Here's how this sounds going into the Vocaster 1. It feels so incredibly wrong to hold this microphone, but I'm just being lazy about it, okay? There's not going to be any handling noise. I'm not going to move it around. It's fine. Calm down. But here is the Electro Voice RE20 going into the Vocaster 1. About 60% gain. And here is the noise floor level associated with me hitting negative 12 decibels on the RE20. Now I have the Audio-Technica AT2035 plugged in. This is a condenser microphone, so 48 volts of phantom power is engaged. And here's how this sounds with my gain at about 35%. Now we have the Loughton, Loughton LA220 plugged in, once again at about 35% gain on the Voicaster 1. Blue is a little bit sad. He doesn't get to do a KPT, a kitty purr test today, but just thought I'd have him say hi anyway. So say hi, Blue. Don't say hi to yourself, say hi to them. Gosh, he's so silly. <laughs> now I'm gonna plug in a few shotgun microphones. Now we have a microphone that I've actually wanted for a really long time plugged in. This is the Sennheiser MKH-50. And here's how this beautiful microphone sounds going into the Vocaster 1. Now I have the Sennheiser MKH-416 plugged into the Vocaster 1. Am I doing this for selfish reasons because I want to hear it versus the MKH-50? You're damn right. But here is how the MKH-416 sounds going into the Vocaster 1. Now this is the Octava MK-012 with the hypercardioid capsule on. And here's how it sounds going into the Vocaster 1. This is a small diaphragm condenser microphone. Here's the sound of the Audio-Technica AT-875R at about 30% gain on the Vocaster 1. And here is how this short condenser shotgun microphone sounds going into it. So when it comes to me testing the Vocaster 1 versus the Focusrite Scarlet 2i2, it doesn't make a ton of sense because they are pretty different. Without any hesitation, I can absolutely say that if you are a musician, you're going to be recording music or anything like that, definitely go with like the Scarlet or Claret line. The Vocaster 1, definitely more your content creator, podcaster interface. With that being said, though, I still do want to compare the Vocaster 1 hitting negative 12 decibels and the noise floor level associated with that 
versus the 2i2 in that same situation hitting negative 12 decibels. I just want to see how the preamps perform against each other. So even though a comparison isn't super valid because they are different, this will at least answer the question for the podcaster that's trying to decide between the Scarlett and the Vocaster. So here is a test with the Shure SM7B, no post-processing, nothing like that. Currently on my peaks, I am hitting negative 12 decibels, and here is how the noise floor level sounds when I shut the hell up. Now I'm plugged into the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 third generation, and I would say in order to hit about negative 12 decibels, I'm, you know, up there, I'm about 80%. And here is how it sounds on the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 with the SM7B. Of course, I'm not using any mic activators or post-processing because I'm not a complete asshole, just mostly an asshole, but not a complete one. And just so we know we're hitting it absolutely perfectly, I'm going to actually play some white noise into the SM7B until it is hitting exactly negative 12 decibels. And then at that point, I'll show you the noise floor level associated with the Vocaster and then with the Scarlet. Well, now that we've gone through the basics, the specs, we did some testing and everything, now I'm ready to give you my review, my opinion of the Focusrite Vocaster 1. So I could sit here and say like, oh, it doesn't record as high a quality as the Scarlett 2i2. Oh, it doesn't have combo jacks. And I could definitely gripe about some of those more musician-based features. But considering Focusrite was very forward about who this is for, I just don't think that's really fair. So to put it bluntly, if you are going to be doing spoken word content, I think this is an absolutely fantastic product. Now, if I needed to record music and podcasts and do live streaming, I think that, you know, the Scarlet or the Claret line, if you're looking at Focusrite products exclusively, I think those are the right choices for you. Well, now that I've given you kind of a broad statement about the Vocaster 1, now let me just narrow down some of the things that I really like about it and some things that I'm kind of whatever about. I do wish this had a headphone volume control and an output volume control. Being able to dial in and control both of those are really nice and you could use that additional output with that additional control to send out to like a different camera or a different recorder and that would be so nice. So I am a little bit bummed that it doesn't have like that monitor and headphone control like the 2i2 does. Now when it comes to the pros of the interface, uh, there are a lot of them. I love that it can do 24 bit at 48 kilohertz. That's what I like to record at. So I'm very happy it can do that. Would I like to see it go up to 96 kilohertz or 192 kilohertz? Sure, but I don't think it's needed. I am shocked that I'm saying this because I did not think I was going to like this, but I actually think the auto gain feature on this interface works very well. It can set it slightly high sometimes, but most of the time it nails it. It never sets it too high in the sense that I'm like clipping or anything. It just sets it slightly higher than I would personally, but I like hitting that negative 18 to negative 12 decibel range. And this can sometimes hit the like negative 14 to negative 10 decibel range when you do the auto gain. So the fact that I like the auto gain feature is actually shocking to me. I love the fact that this has post-processing available. I don't think the presets are absolutely mind blowing or anything, but I do think they're very usable. And in fact, with this microphone right here, the TC Helicon Go XLR mic, I think that the radio setting on the Vocaster 1 actually sounds really soft. Now, it's not necessarily a con, but I would love it if they added more post-processing presets. The fact that this preamp has a gain range of 70 decibels is absolutely impressive. There's no problem whatsoever driving the Shure SM7B, which I know is like always the question when it comes to interfaces like this. The Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 has a 56 decibel gain range, I believe. And to me, I think it can push the Shure SM7B like pretty well, but the Vocaster 1 and Vocaster 2 have an amazing gain range. That's awesome. And I think that the preamps are actually really good. They're not super noisy or anything. I was worried that the headphone preamp could be a little bit more on the noisy side. I know that with the Rodecaster Pro, the first one, not the second one, the headphone preamps were awful and you weren't sure if your microphone was making a lot of noise or if it was just in your headphones. It was not great. But here that is not a problem. However, I will say 
I would like the headphones to be maybe a little bit louder. So if you do have some Sennheiser HD 650s that you're going to be using, this will be a little bit on the quieter side, but it's not too bad. But I absolutely love that you can plug your phone into here and get your phone's audio. I do think on the Vocaster 2, it being Bluetooth compatible is fantastic. I would love to try that out on my own. The camera out on here, I love that. And overall, I just think the features that this has are really good. With how many people have been jumping into the podcasting, you know, like content creation realm, there have been a few duds of products from companies. But I will say that Focusrite's Vocaster One is not one of those duds. This is actually a very fantastic interface. It's going to make a lot of content creators very happy. So overall, the grade that I give the Focusrite Vocaster One is an A. I was genuinely surprised and very happy by this. I actually think that I'm going to find myself using this interface quite a bit. So thank you all for watching this review of the Vocaster One. I hope it helped you out, helped you decide whether you want to get one of these or not. But most of all, I hope you had fun. Stay tuned for some other reviews, comparisons, some live streams, some giveaways even. And another big thank you to Focusrite for sending this over for me to try it out. It was so cool to be able to get it early and uh, have a little bit of a secret. You know, I liked it. It felt naughty. <laughs> But a big thank you to everyone that is a member of the Audio Hotline. You guys are the best people on the planet. But also thank you to everyone that subscribes and watches and is loyal. But this has been the Audio Hotline. I'm Bronson, and I'll see you audio nerds next time.